Leslie, and I'm sure you're all thinking, where's Nikki? I'm used to Nikki. Where is Nikki? Who, who are you? Who is this person? And I'm here to tell you that I'm taking over for today's zoo classroom. In fact, not only am I taking over, but my friend Kristen is going to help me take over from the North Carolina Aquarium at Fort Fisher. So we are doing a special zoo classroom today because we wanted to kind of show you what our new exciting program called Creature Connections from Land to Sea is going to be a little bit about and hopefully answer some questions about it and tell you how to get involved in this really fun collaboration between the North Carolina Zoo and the North Carolina Aquarium at Fort Fisher. So like I said, taking over. Can't have it today, Nikki. <laughs> or Megan, or Donna, or anybody, it's ours. So first things first though, to before we get started, just a couple of quick things. If you haven't been with us before, um, welcome if it's your first time. And if you've been here before, welcome back. Uh, a couple of things, you were muted on purpose as you came in to the classroom today. Also, we, videos are off during this. And uh, there are kind of two different play, ways that you're gonna connect with us. So. Even though you can't, we can't hear you and we can't see you, we're still gonna try to be as interactive as possible. First and foremost, if I have any questions that I want you all to answer, you can put those in the chat box. So when I ask you something, write your answer in the chat box. Now, if you have a question for me or for Kristen, then you can put that question in our Q and A. Not only are us two here to answer those questions, but we have a whole team of wonderful experts um, typing away either back at the zoo, because technically we're not at the zoo right now. I know it looks like we are, but spoiler alert, we're actually right next to the zoo uh, in our studio and or at their homes, helping make sure that this is so much fun and educational for you all. Okay, that being said. So did you know that this month, October, is Wolf Awareness Month. Now, Chelsea, who's my friend who's hanging out with me today, she, with me today she was like, I didn't know that. I think that was Chelsea that yeah, said. Right, in October, I know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I also do have Megan here with me today, so. Yay. <laughs> She's behind the camera. So, October is Wolf Awareness Month. And what we wanted to do to, um, to kind of connect the land and the sea today is to talk about some animals that have a lot of miscommunication about them and really are cool animals that need our help to protect. In fact, the North Carolina Zoo and the North Carolina Aquarium at Fort Fisher do things to actively help protect these animals. And since Wolf Awareness Month you know I had to go with the red wolves today, right? <laughs> you knew I had to. So first what we're going to do is I have a quick little poll for you all. So if um, we have a poll that's going to ask a little bit about uh, what makes, uh, what do you think of when you think of the word wolf? If um, Beth, I believe, is my person who's going to be doing that. Yes, um, I was going to say, say Miss Beth. So <laughs> if you can, there are a couple of different um, words there that we want you to try to see if you can connect what makes what do you think of when you think of the word wolf just wolf not a specific type of word or wolf or anything just wolf we'll wait for those to kind of go in um, and see if we can get those answers in a bit but I don't know about you all when I think of wolf I typically think of that big gray wolf um, so Chelsea, if you could put up a picture of a gray wolf, this is kind of like that iconic wolf, the one that I think a lot of people think of. If anybody has ever seen those t-shirts, I love these t-shirts, where it has like the wolf heads and then they're howling at the moon. Those are usually gray wolves. So here's a picture of a gray wolf for you. Um, they tend to be big, gray color, uh, lots of really thick fur, and that's usually what I think of when I think of a gray wolf, or when I think of a wolf. Now, Beth, are you able to give us those uh, answers to the poll real quick? Let's see what yep. you all think. I can actually give them to you. Oh, okay. So we had 8% say big, 69% said howl, 8% said we had we had three ways split between mean, fluffy, and cute. They all, there was 8% <laughs> on all three of those. So our biggest one is howl. And you know what's really funny is I made that connection too. I said, 
that I think of that t-shirt that where they're all howling at the moon. That's really, really interesting. We, uh, that's what we tend to think of is the howling. And then in between that, we had big, which yes, they are relatively big animals. Um, and then a lot of us think of mean and cute and cuddly as well. But today, so even though that's normally what we think of when we think of wolf, today we're going to talk about the American red wolf. So Chelsea, if you could put a picture of my friend, the American red wolf up there, and we'll be able to notice a couple of differences real quick. Let's okay. see if you all can. And when the picture goes up, why don't you type in the chat some differences that you see between the gray wolf and the red wolf? There he is. What do you see differences? I know we don't have the gray wolf up there anymore, but are there any differences that you can remember from the gray wolf to the American red wolf? Okay, so um, Logan says color. Um, color. Angela says smaller. Okay, yeah. Um, yeah, getting a lot of different colors is what they're noticing. Uh, Charles says the red wolf is more like a fox. Uh, Attica says skinnier. Great, everybody. So Chelsea, you can come on back to me. I think the biggest one that you all see that I agree with is that color. So our American red wolf is going to be more of this reddish color. And then our gray wolf is going to be more of that gray color, even kind of a dark black color as well in certain parts. You can see the little tips are still kind of dark and black and things like that. So yeah, that color is a really big one. But also some of the things that you said size. Our American red wolves are a lot smaller than gray wolves. They tend to be, anybody want to guess? Let's see. How big do you think a gray wolf can get in pounds? Any guesses? A million pounds? A quadrillion pounds? An umptillion pounds? I'm just making up stuff, friends. Really? I was really, I was really looking forward to seeing an umptillion pound or something. <laughs> I pulled naked for a second, probably. But <laughs> <I never know. laughs> Any guesses? We've got 100, 3,000, 150 to 200, 20 pounds, 81 pounds. Or one with an infinite amount of zeros. Oh, wow. <laughs> I'm telling you, that's right. I think that might be the umpteen. I'm telling you. <laughs> I'm telling you. So, um, we have a couple there that were right in that kind of uh, the range of the gray wolf, which is about like 80 pounds to more like 120 ish pounds. Um, red wolves, American red wolves, are more like 40 to 75 ish pounds. Um, so they are, they are a little bit smaller, they're a little bit leggier and leaner, and they do tend to not have to get as thick or as long of fur either. So American red wolves, they um, used to live, which I think we have a good picture of this, Miss Chelsea, if you could put that up for us. Um, they used to live in a lot more places than they do right now. Um, so you can see this nice big map that shows the United States. Um, and we have a part where there's kind of lines going through and then a part that has no lines going through it. I think it's red. Is it red? Yeah. It's red. Oh, like yeah. Red. Red. Nice. So, um, so that red part is where American red wolves used to live for a really long time. But what happened is when um, people came over from Europe, they decided they didn't like the American red wolf. And so they asked if we could get rid of it. So the numbers of the American red wolf started to go down and down and down and down and down, down to the point where there's only like 15 left in the wilds now. All of, you might be able to kind of use your marker to circle where in North Carolina you can find yeah. um, Chelsea, the American red wolf in the wild. So we took, we as in scientists, took um, some of the American red, not me, as Lynn said, <laughs> the American <laughs> red wolf from kind of where they were found, um, in, I believe it was in Texas, right around in Texas, and moved them over to kind of where Chelsea is pointing right now, and that is the, off the coast of North Carolina. 
Does anybody happen to know? I bet if you have come to some of our zoo classrooms, you may have learned where we can only find American red wolves. I'm going to challenge you. Ooh. I know. It's got a big fancy name. Um, but right off the coast. North Carolina, North Carolina. Get more specific. Yeah, does anybody where, know? Does anybody know where in North Carolina, what the name of that wildlife refuge is? I'll give you a hint. It's named after a river. <laughs> and the river is named after a very snappy animal. Oh, oh Lisa. Uh, North Carolina, Alligator River. Yay! Yay! Uh, Yay. Yeah, Alligator <laughs> River National Wildlife Refuge. So they are, they're only found right there in the wild. But we do find more of them in under human care. Um, so we have about 200, over 200 in, in human care as well, including some that we have at the North Carolina Zoo. So I, these amazing creatures, we have a couple of kind of like miscommunications we usually have about them. So I'm going to ask you all, I have another poll for you, and this one's going to be about coyotes. Mm. Same kind of question. What do you think when you hear the word coyote? Mm. And it kind of goes with the first miscommunication we have, which is that American red wolves and coyotes are the same thing. If you think that they're the same thing, put in a yes. If you don't think they're the same thing, put in a no. And how do you tell the difference Ooh. if they aren't the same thing? What do you think? Put in the chat, what do you think? How do you tell the difference? If they aren't the same thing, how do you tell the difference between an American red wolf and a coyote? Well, right off the bat, we've got Charles, Angela, and Paula. They're saying that no. The red wolf and the coyote are not the same. Yeah, great job. They are not the same. They do look very, very similar. So I do have a picture um, that Chelsea's going to put up that has kind of a really good side by side of an American red wolf and a coyote. All right. So Logan okay. is saying they're they aren't the same thing and they are different colors. They can be somewhat different colors, but I would say for the most part, they're relatively similar. Um, the red wolf maybe has a little bit more red in it and the coyote maybe has a little less red in it, but they do look really similar. Now in this picture, one looks a little bit smaller than the other, would you say? So, um, so yeah, I mean, sometimes if you're looking at a picture of them, it can be really easy to sit there and look and pick and point, pinpoint everything. But if you can go to our next picture, Chelsea, here's a picture of a coyote in the winter. Ooh. Looks way more like the American red wolf, right? Has that big fluffy fur, looks a lot bigger. So sometimes it is a little bit harder to tell them apart. And that's one of the reasons that um, uh, it's really hard for people. Sometimes people will get people asking us, I think I saw a wolf in my backyard. And I will say, if you don't live in the Alligator <laughs> River National Wildlife Refuge, chances are it was a coyote because they do look very similar. All right, if you could bring it back to me, Chelsea. So my um, next question that I have for all of you is, American red wolves are dangerous or they're aggressive. Type in yes or no, what do you think? Dangerous and aggressive, not dangerous and aggressive. We'll get that poll later, I forgot about it. Okay, the results are in, so. Okay. <laughs> do you think American red wolves are dangerous and aggressive? No, we got some dangerous, some no, some, one said yes, no. <laughs> <laughs> like, yeah, well, I could do that, maybe, yeah. Or dangerous, yes, but not aggressive. Or it's kind of split, dangerous and no, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're right. See, you all know your stuff. American red wolves, not really dangerous animals, not really aggressive animals. In fact, even our American red wolves here at the North Carolina Zoo that are in front of the habitat, their names are Pigeon and Flynn, they still see people every day and still will be a little bit like, I'm not sure about you. Hey, go look at you. You're like, well, I'm not sure. I don't know about you over there. So even ones that are used to people are still kind of keep their distance. And American red wolves definitely do keep their distance. Why don't we get that answer to that poll? We'll see what um, our coyote, what people think when we think of coyotes. So uh, we've got the majority of the, well, actually we're 
tied between mean and cute at 31 percent. <laughs> that's, kind of that's awesome. <laughs> And then our next is fluffy at 19 percent, okay. big at two or at uh, 13 percent, and nuisance at six percent. And oh. I'm thinking because I I was trying to think of a better word for nuisance because that's kind of a hard word. Um, but it depends on who you talk to. Some people will definitely that would have been their number one. But I did. It, it's kind of interesting how different it is. With a lot of um, our friends said coyotes are are mean, but wolves. No, they're pretty cool. Like they howl, they're, they're not so bad. So we kind of have this thought in our head that coyotes aren't really as nice. And since they look so similar to the American red wolf, a lot of people think American red wolves are coyotes and thus think they're mean or scary and aggressive. All right. So real quick, yeah. are you able to define what nuisance means? Oh, okay. So nuisance. This is an interesting thing to explain. Let me see if I can't explain it. Maybe two of the other people will do a better job at it. <laughs> so nuisance is that they get kind of get into trouble a lot, or they are doing something that bothers you, basically. So if you were to say this person is talking at me and yelling at me and they're not leaving me alone and I've told them to leave me alone, but they're still doing all these things. They're kind of like a new, you could say, use the word nuisance. So it means that they're kind of like nagging at you or they're, they're taking your time and um, you don't want them to basically. So getting in the way, that's a good way. <laughs> we use it a lot with animals though. Did we have I do have a couple of questions. Sure, yeah. Um, so Leah wants to know where do coyotes live? So that's a great question. Coyotes, and we had that picture, um, I don't know if Chelsea can um, go back to it and bring it up, but we did have that map. So coyotes, when American red wolves were found in their kind of indigenous or native habitat um, before, um, bef before people from Europe started to come over and say, I don't like these animals, um, they, coyotes tend to live in the western, midwestern and western part of um, the United States. But once those those American red red wolves, their numbers started going down and down and down and down. Coyotes started to move into the area that American red wolves were in. So if we still had had the normal number of American red wolves, then we probably wouldn't have coyotes here on the East Coast, which is kind of interesting to think of. But the coyotes um, were like, hey, there's tons of land over there. There's no big there's no big wolves. Um, that I need to stay away from. Well, let's go over there. There's lots of food over there. So coyotes now can be found in most of the United States. And one more question. Sure. Um, this kind of goes to what we, the three of us were talking about earlier. Atticus wants to know, can we keep them as pets? <laughs> <laughs> I guess you prepared. <laughs> Um, <laughs> Chelsea joked about this earlier, and I was like, yes! Yeah. <laughs> so, American Red Wolves do not make good pets. First, it's illegal. <laughs> so, there's a full stop to that, right? It's great, um, great. Also, they need a lot of really specific, specific health care. So, our people here at the zoo that take care of them have lots of training, know how to um, feed them, know how to prepare the food for them. They eat a lot of mice and fish. Um, and things like that. They have to have a very specific habitat that they live in as well. And um, you're not allowed to. So I mean, <laughs> like I said, that's a, that's a full stop right there. So, they, but they do not make good pets. They also smell really bad. Um, <laughs> they yes. do a lot of digging. They smell really bad. Uh, that sounds mean. But they, they're not the greatest smelling things. And they tend to, if something is in their area, urinate or pee on everything so that everything knows that it's their territory. So, so I would say no, they do not make good pets. But we do have dogs and dogs are canines just like um, wolves are canines. So, you know, if you have a dog, just call it an American red wolf. There you go. <laughs> be like, it could be a little chihuahua and you can say, here's my American red wolf. It's a weird wolf. <laughs> I, I call my kitten the lioness. <laughs> yes. <laughs> But now they do not make it. <laughs> do we have any uh, questions real quick before I keep going? I do not see awesome. any other questions. So can anybody tell me why American red wolves are important? <laughs> why are they important in their habitat? What do they do that's important? Does anybody know? It has to do with what they eat. Get that hint. Mm. Mm. Yeah, sorry. 
we would say is deer. Um, and if there's too many deer around, then that all those deer will kind of eat up all the rest of the nutrients and, and food in that habitat. So a good amount of deer and a good amount of predators, you want everything equal. We call that an equilibrium. So everything together is at a good like level. Um, and so everything works together very well. But you're right, they are carnivores. So we see this nice, these nice big teeth that they're able to eat meat out of. They'll eat, also eat things like um, nutria, which kind of looks, we were trying to explain this earlier. <laughs> nutria to each other. Nutria kind of looks like a tiny beaver without a flat tail. That's how I ended up describing it. Um, raccoons, they eat mice, and other animals that actually damage crops. So, um, people who have a lot of agriculture um, and gardens should really like to have uh, these animals around so that they can have there's more prey control. So we have our red wolf and then there is also the here's the gray wolf when you're looking at the the size of our plastic skulls. Wow. You definitely see that that difference in size. And then even but they are they're relatively close but even our um what are these called? Uh coyotes. <laughs> Still relatively the same size. So they are. They're very important to have in their in the habitat because they're great prey control. It's also the more different types of plants and animals that we have in the world, the healthier the world is. Um, so we call that biodiversity. And biodiversity is very important for the world. So the more red wolves, the more different types of wolves, the more different types of canines that we have, the healthier world we have. So having red wolves, even though coyotes are kind of filling that, that part of their life um, or that part of the niche or niche, niche, if you want, whichever way you want to say it, um, it's still better for the health of the world to have more biodiversity. Now we did say that they are not doing so well. Um, they, a lot of them were killed when, when settlers came in um, from Europe. And so the zoo is actually doing some cool things to help these animals. Does anybody know? Let's, I, uh, we have a lot of names that I've seen before. So I really think some of you will know the answers to this. Does anybody know how we help save the red wolves at the North Carolina Zoo? Mm -hmm. I just awkwardly dance when. Same. Wow, those are awesome moves. You have to teach me. Breeding program. Great job, yeah. So we have our breeding program here at the North Carolina Zoo. It is part of the SSP, or Species Survival Plan. And one thing that's really cool about the North Carolina Zoo is that the person who is in charge of the Species Survival Plan works right here at the North Carolina Zoo. And his name is Chris Lasher. So he is actually helping write down, create um, all of these plans to help save and kind of create this recovery for the red wolves. He works right here with us and it's pretty amazing um, that, to have somebody so close that is helping save these animals. We're also part of what's called SAFE, um, which is a program with the Association of Zoos and Aquariums um, that addresses kind of like what we need to help these animals and also like recovery plans for these um, species. And Chelsea is actually going to put in a link in the chat. If you wanted to read um, or look at it, it was help the one of the people who did it is Chris Lasher again. So <laughs> he is in charge of this SAFE program which SAFE stands for Saving Animals from Extinction. Um, and we've also in the past been able to reintroduce some of our pups in back into the wild to help the numbers. So once Chelsea, I asked her to do one thing and then I should do another thing real quick. I got you. <laughs> so once Chelsea is available, she's gonna give you some cuteness overload and show you some of the red wolf pups that we've had here at the- Oh my goodness. <laughs> 
yes. That's... Yeah, so we have been able to have, <coughs> excuse me, I'm choking on my own spit. Uh, <laughs> anybody else ever done that? Um, I'm ta you talk too fast and then you just inhale your spit. I am such a lovely person. <laughs> <laughs> um, so these pictures of these, um, American red wolves, they are actual wolves that we have had born here at the North Carolina Zoo. And um, our hope is to, even if they can't be in, in the wild, is to have them under human care so that the animal does not completely go extinct. So we have over 200, I said, I said 200 earlier, but it's over 250 really, um, animals in over 40 different locations of um, American red wolves. So it's pretty amazing that we're able to take these animals that are so misunderstood and help take care of them. And that being said, I know down at the coast, I have another friend, Miss Kristen, who has some misunderstood friends that also um, need protection. So I'm gonna pass it on over to Miss Kristen. Can you hear me? Can you hear me all the way down there, Kristen? Wait, say that again one more time. Can, I, can you hear me? I gotcha, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna pass it way down over there to the coast of Fort Fisher um, Aquarium. Uh, Miss Kristen, if you wanted to take over and tell us a little bit about your friend um, that the aquarium is helping protect. Absolutely. I am all about taking over. Thank you so much for letting me take over today. I am so excited. Um, first off, I want to say um, that I am not under the water. <laughs> I am posted up just outside of our amazing Cape Fear Shoals habitat right here at the aquarium at Fort Fisher. Um, and you probably have heard that we keep saying the North Carolina Aquarium at Fort Fisher. Our amazing state, North Carolina, has three North Carolina aquariums. So just to help you get your bearings, we are the southernmost aquarium in our state, about 20 miles south of Wilmington. Um, so we tend to speak with a little bit more of a southern accent, which is a really bad joke. But we, um, we do have this amazing um, uh, habitat right behind us. And we are gonna be talking about one of our most misunderstood species today that is also a part of that SAFE program. So again, saving animals from extinction. And that is the sand tiger shark. So just give me a big yay if you love sand tigers in the chat. I could spend the entire time going yay, 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 yay. I love sand tigers. They are amazing. Um, and I'm really hopeful that we will have a couple. We do have two sand tiger sharks that are in this Cape Fear Shoals habitat. I'm really hopeful that they will swim by to say hello, but I do want to point out my friend here, not a shark. This is a gag grouper um, and they love being on camera. <laughs> so I'm sure you will see them quite frequent, frequently. Um, so hi to everyone who was saying hello. Thank you again so much for letting us take over. And just as I requested, there is one of our beautiful sand tiger sharks. Um, so I have a poll question for you guys as well. So very similar to what Ms. Leslie was asking you, I want to know your thoughts about sand tigers. So Chelsea, are we able to put up our sand tiger poll question? Excellent, wonderful. So again, our question is, which of these words do you think most relates to sharks? So let's see what you guys think. Our options are teeth, soup, shipwreck, fins, and big. All right, so I love asking about sharks and I love talking about sharks because they are so misunderstood. Um, in some ways they have a bad reputation. Um, in some ways they have great reputations. So I always like to kind of get a, a feel for how we feel about sharks when we're talking about them. Um, here at our aquarium, we do focus a lot on this particular species, the sand tigers, and I'll go into more detail about that there she is again, swimming by. Thank you for that. I'll have to make sure I give them, get them a special treat later for helping us with this program today. All right, so I see in the comment, I hope no one says soup, you know? Lots of people actually do think soup when they hear the word shark. Um, do you guys wanna comment in the chat as to why? Why do you think that soup is related to sharks? And I see that our results are ready, so let's hear about those. 
All right, so you, oh. are we good? Okay. All right, sorry about that, guys. So <laughs> we've got 60% uh, saying teeth um, as, a, as a majority. We got 5% that said uh, soup, 5% um, said fins, and 30% said big. Okay, yeah. So I see that someone put in the chat shark fin soup, and you are exactly right. In certain parts of the world, sharks are mostly equated as a food source, and one of those foods is shark fin soup. Um, so it's kind of a, an interesting twist on how we think about sharks. But I want to kind of break it down a little more so we can get to know um, the sand tiger in particular. Um, so the sand tiger is one of those animals that has, um, if we were saying this earlier, and I think it is the absolute best word to describe a sand tiger, they just look a little derpy, guys. They are amazing animals, but they just have this expression, sort of, um, that makes them look almost confused, but at the same time, really intimidating. Um, so it's, it's an interesting animal to get to know a little bit better. Um, I believe we have a picture of the sand tiger since, since ours and our Cape Fear Shoals habitat are just kind of cruising by. They're not stopping for very long. I did want to give you the chance. Oh, of course, we're going to go back to the adorable wolves. Really, guys? Gosh, but we are talking sharks. So there is our um, sand tiger shark. And I just want you to get a good look at this animal. Um, again, a little bit on the derpy side, but very intimidating. And many of you answered the poll saying that teeth are the, the thing that you relate most to sharks. And that is the most common response that I get when talking about sharks. Um, so we're gonna talk a little bit more about what exactly those teeth are all about. Um, but I want you to notice the beautiful color of the sand tiger shark. Um, in my experience as an educator about sharks, people always think that sharks are gray, and they aren't necessarily. There are many shades of gray, of course, at least, well, there are many shades of gray, but this particular one is almost coppery in color. And you'll notice that along the side, there are some spots as well. So sand tigers have this kind of a brownish, coppery, some people say that they see green. That's not how my eyes usually see them, but coppery, grayish, brownish, but many of them have those spots. Now, sharks are, of course, fish. And one of the things that we often hear about sharks is that they are the biggest fish. Now, that is true, but there's one in particular that is the biggest fish out in the ocean. Do you guys happen to know which one it is? It is a type of shark. The whale shark, yes, very good. So the whale shark is the biggest fish, and sometimes that gives people this idea that all sharks are gonna be really, really large. But do you know that 80% of sharks are actually gonna be shorter than six feet long? So most of those sharks that we have out in our oceans are gonna be very small, okay? Now, the sand tigers, also have those dominant dorsal fins, like all sharks are known to have. They actually have two, and they're located further back on their body. Now, I couldn't have asked for a better timing. One of our sandbar sharks just swam by. It has one very prominent dorsal fin on its back, and it's sort of in the middle of its body. So that's another characteristic that sets apart the sand tiger from other sharks is that they have those two dorsals and it's further towards the back. All right, so let's kind of look a little more specifically at those teeth. You may have noticed in the image that we showed and also from our sand tigers that are swimming by, they are always showing their teeth. Now, I have an up close model for you. So these are sand tiger teeth. I'm gonna hopefully get my camera to adjust a little bit better. There's a lot for it to focus on today. But they have these long, thin, exceptionally sharp teeth. Okay? But they also have here in the corner very, very small and closely connected teeth. Now, think for just a moment. You have your absolute favorite meal in front of you. Now, I'm going to make the assumption that this is sort of a carnivorous meal since we are thinking sharks. Okay, so you have your favorite just 
dense or carnivorous meal sitting in front of you. You're so hungry, you're ready to eat, but you don't have hands. You don't have arms. How do you eat? What do you think, guys? Put it in the chat. How do you eat your carnivorous meal without arms? Kind of crazy to think about, right? So these teeth that we've been talking about and been focusing on, they are so important to these sharks for their ability to eat. And when we see these really long, thin, sharp teeth, then we can kind of equate that to some of the utensils that you and I eat with. Think about a fork. Do you see the tines of a fork kind of mirrored in the teeth of the sand tiger? Yeah, so think about how you would use a fork. You would use it to stab your food or hold it in place. You might even use it for tearing, right? And that is exactly how a sand tiger is going to eat. Now, I mentioned before that the sand tigers are always showing their teeth, right? So there's a really interesting reason for this too. Being that they're fish, they do have gills. They have to breathe in the water, okay? But their gills need them to continue to move, to pull that water through their bodies and across their gills so that they can have sufficient amounts of oxygen. So they're always swimming with their mouths open, allowing that water to flow through their mouth and across their gills. Now, one of the things that is really unique about the sand tiger is how they can actually sit very, very still in the water. Okay, I see we've got a couple of questions and I am gonna to get to those in just a quick second. So those sand tigers can sit very, very still in the water. They have these kind of scary teeth, right? And they don't have eyelids. Now, if you have an animal that is always staring at you because they don't have eyelids, they have these big, sharp, scary teeth and they're not moving, they're just kind of sitting still, that can lead one to get a little intimidated by these animals. And then you add on to that, that they can become very large. So this particular species is going to be up to about nine feet. So think about that for a moment. How would you feel if you were confronted with a shark with really long, sharp, scary teeth and no blinking, always staring at you and just hovering in the water? How does that feel? I see definitely nightmares, okay? <laughs> I would agree, some people would say that would be super frightening, all right? Creepy, definitely. And it looks like Joey is just screaming. I'm sorry, didn't mean to set you off, friend. <laughs> the same with Logan. But yeah, so that is one of the issues that this particular species faces, right? So they have these behaviors, they have these, um, identifiers about them that make them a little intimidating and it can be hard to understand. Um, so they are often misunderstood. So let's jump over to some of our questions. What is that shark's name? That is a fantastic question and I have to be honest with you, I don't know that that shark has a name. The reason that I don't have a name specifically um, known for that animal is because we don't really talk to them. So to have a name for her doesn't necessarily help us. It would help just to say, oh, hi, this is fill in the blank. But our way of communicating them is actually far more visual. Um, so if for today, if you want to, give us a name, give us a suggestion, and I'll take it to our aquariology staff and say, hey, we've got some friends who want her to have a name, so let's give her a name. So put your suggestions in the chat box and I'll see what I can do for you. So why are the teeth so thin? That's a great question. So the thinner they are, the more sharp they will be. And that allows them to grab a hold of their prey and just puncture it and hold it in their mouth. And I know there's a kind of some scary terms, but if you think about it, when you're really hungry, don't you wanna grab a hold of your food and hold it in your mouth? You don't want it to go anywhere, you wanna eat it, right? And that's exactly what they're doing. Why are people scared of sharks? They're so cool. You know what? You are my people, Angela. That is absolutely the way I feel about it too. But I think one of the main reasons that people are so afraid of sharks is because we have heard they can bite people. Now this is often, and I would go so far as to say always, 
an issue of misidentification. So sometimes sharks are very, very curious. Well, I should say all the time, they're very curious. They fill out their environment using their vision, but also they're using um, stimulus around them. They can feel what's happening around them very well. And so when we are in the water and we're playing and we're thinking, yes, best day ever, having fun in the ocean, those sharks are like, hey, what's happening? That looks fun. And they're gonna come and check us out. But when they feel threatened, when they feel frightened, that is when those bite incidents happen. Now, I do want to mention that there are organizations, there are lists that keep track of when are sharks biting people. And the numbers would actually really, really surprise you. Sand tigers have only reportedly bitten 29 individuals. And that is way less than the number of people who go into the oceans every year. So, one of our common questions is to ask, are shark bites frequent? And they are not, okay? It does not happen all that often. But when it does happen, unfortunately, we hear about it from just about every angle of the media, right? Um, and it's good to be aware when our sharks have had um, an incident, but there's no need to be afraid of them. We just have to take those precautions. And I will be glad to have conversations through email with anyone who has questions about what precautions to take. All right, so I'm seeing some great suggestions here. Flippy, Shelly, Spots, okay. And then here's a great one. Don't sharks use their stomachs as swim bladders to fill them with gas to stay at a certain level in the ocean. Oh my gosh, Charles, you're brilliant. <laughs> so. Sand tiger sharks are the only ones who will go up to the surface. They will gulp air because they don't have a swim bladder like other fish, and they will hold that air in their tummies so that they can hover, like I was saying before. So they stay in one place hovering in the water, not blinking and showing off those scary teeth. <laughs> so they are pretty special to be able to do that. And I love all of these suggestions that are coming in. All right, now I do want to kind of um, kind of switch over a little bit. We've talked a lot about the sand tiger, what it looks like, its reputation. Um, I want to really give you some insight into what we are doing here at the aquarium with sand tigers. Um, we do have these two individuals that are in this particular habitat. Our big goal for the North Carolina Aquarium at Fort Fisher is to hopefully renovate at some point, maybe in the next 10 years or so, and we want to become a breeding habitat for sand tigers. Right now, we are participating in research that's taking place all around the Cape Fear region. So in the oceans, in our, um, in our bays, in our estuaries, where these sharks might venture. And we're trying to figure out where are the sand tigers going? What are they doing? And we have learned that these amazing predators that do so much great work to keep our oceans and our estuaries um, and salt marshes really healthy, North Carolina is doing something pretty good for them too. We so frequently find these sand tigers around our shipwrecks. Now, how many of you know what the nickname of North Carolina is because we have so many shipwrecks? It's kind of a creepy one, which is kind of appropriate for October since we're going into Halloween season. But we are called the graveyard of the Atlantic because there are so many shipwrecks along our coast. And these sand tigers are just hanging out around those shipwrecks. So the question became why? What are they so excited about? What do they like about these shipwrecks? And so we have again this research project that's going on and the research is supporting that maybe these sand tigers are coming to North Carolina to our shipwrecks so that they can have their pups. Now that is a huge thing for sand tigers. So we want to make sure that we are that we are you know, discovering this correctly. Are they definitely doing that? Are they coming to North Carolina to have their pups? And if so, what can we do to make it the best situation possible? Now, across the board, shark species are declining. There are some that are doing better than others. With sand tiger sharks, they are a species considered to be vulnerable. Now, you might have heard terms like endangered or threatened. Those are more severe cases. 
vulnerability suggests that there is a decline and if we don't make some changes, then they're going to be also either endangered or threatened. So what do we do? How do we help sharks? Well, this research that I've been discussing, that's one way. We have to learn more about them. And folks, you're here learning about them right now. That goes a long way too. Just knowing more about them, understanding them is a huge help to those animals. Well, in addition to that, one of the biggest issues for sharks along our coast is that they might get tangled up in nets that provide seafood for us. That's what we call bycatch. And when a shark is tangled up as bycatch and it's not actually used as a food source, then man, that's just a waste of a really cool animal, right? So we wanna make sure that we are making seafood choices that are best for us. If we're gonna eat seafood, we wanna make sure that it has been sustainably caught. So I know that we're gonna provide you guys a link to this amazing app and um, program that was initiated out of Monterey Bay Aquarium and it's called Seafood Watch. And Seafood Watch helps us identify where our seafoods came from. So if we know where our seafoods came from, then we can figure out how they were caught and then we can know how much bycatch was involved. And we wanna make those choices that are more sustainable with the least amount of bycatch so that we know we're doing our part to help out those sharks. Now I see we have a couple more questions here. Is it true that people can't wear jewelry in a shark territory because the sharks could confuse them? So that is absolutely true. Um, the thing you wanna think about is a shark is very visual, right? They're looking for the ways that sunlight might kind of reflect off of a smaller fish, their prey items, scales. So if you're wearing jewelry that might reflect the sun and flash like the scales of a fish would, then that's probably not the safest choice while you're in the water. So if you take off those shiny jewelry pieces, then you're definitely making a smart choice. All right, what do the sharks eat at the aquarium? All of the bad summer campers. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> so we do target feed our sharks. They are going to get some pretty large pieces of fish and it, it varies really. They get a lot of different types because as apex predators, they're not just, just going to eat one thing. They're going to eat a variety of foods. Um, we do monitor the weight of our animals. Um, so we make sure that we're providing enough food for them so that they kind of maintain their weight or to gain weight very uh, slowly. Uh, so we weigh them, we make sure we prepare various types of fish. Um, sometimes they will get um, bits of, um, what are the words? Crabs, um, things like that that are also you know, really good for their teeth. And then we make a special food here. It's called gel food. It looks like a green brownie, but it smells like a fish. <laughs> and it has fish meal, algae, and then we blend in other vegetables, believe it or not, like green peppers and carrots, and we add it all to clear gelatin. So when it sets up, again, it looks like a brownie, doesn't smell like it at all. Um, but that's a way that we can make sure that all of our animals get a lot of extra vitamins and nutrients. All right, one of, as a homeschooler, I have done it for 10 years. Oh, very, very cool, amazing. <laughs> And I see that we do have uh, Seafood Watch posted up there. Thank you so, so much. Um, the other thing that I did want to mention to you all is that with our sand tigers having those really, really sharp teeth, we talked about how they look like forks. I want to show you another shark's tooth. And I'm interested to see if you can guess whose tooth this is. Wait just a second to see if we get any ideas in the chat. Hmm. All right, Logan for the wind. I see that one first. So this is a great white tooth. Now, I have to be honest with you, this is a model of a great white tooth. <laughs> but it does have these really tiny sharp serrations along the edge. Now, what utensil do you and I use to eat that this tooth would mimic? If the sand tiger has forks in its mouth, what does the great white have? Hmm. Let's see, what would have these serrated edges? Great job guys, knives. Now you notice that this tooth is white. You notice that these teeth are white. 
What if you come all the way to the coast and you are walking along looking at amazing shells and other super cool finds on the beach and you find a black tooth? Does anyone know what that means? What have you actually found? Is it a different species? I see petrified. Yeah, you found a fossil. So anytime a shark's tooth gets buried under sediment and it's pressurized and it's away from oxygen, it becomes a fossil. So a gray or dark tooth like this one is a fossil. Very good job, friends. All right, so it looks like we have just a couple more questions. Should you go in the water if you have an open cut? So we do want to consider the fact that sharks have very keen senses. The sense of smell is one of those. If you have an open cut, probably not the best choice, but if you cover it, if you have some medication on it and you've got a Band-Aid on it, you're probably perfectly fine. Um, so don't be too, too overly cautious. Those sharks are probably pretty good at feeding themselves, so they're not gonna be so curious in your cut. But, you know, just for safety's sake, it, it doesn't hurt to, to avoid the waters. Do people really eat sharks? And if so, that makes you sad. Yeah, but you know, we have to think about there are certain cultures and certain places around the world where they have to depend on things from the ocean that's from the ocean a little more than maybe you and I do. Maybe they don't have soils that support farming the way that North Carolina does. Um, so there are gonna be things from the ocean that are gonna support those cultures um, as a food source. And so it definitely happens and you know, that's okay, but it just needs to be done sustainably in a way that those populations, those wild populations aren't going to suffer because we don't wanna see a decline in these animals. All right, yes, so a gray or black tooth is a fossil tooth. Very good. We have another question come in. I love these questions. What should you do if you're in open water and there's a shark because YouTube lies about everything? Do they really? <laughs> if you are in the ocean and there is a shark, just simply get out. I mean, it's, it's, it's that simple. Um, there are lots of tips that you might have heard of how to prevent a shark from biting you. Um, basically, we have to consider the fact that when we go into the ocean, we are there for recreation, right? Those sharks live there. So think about if you walked into someone else's house and they didn't want you there, they'd want you to leave, right? So if you go into the ocean and the sharks are there and they're kind of getting the vibe that they don't want you there, then leave. It's just that easy. But honestly, again, the number of shark bites that happen is so low. Um, I love when we get visitors to the aquarium that say, did you hear that there are sharks on the ocean right now? And I'm like, no way, there are sharks in the ocean? When did that happen? Right, they're always there. It, again, the media sometimes will take these news reports and it's good to know about them. I'm not saying that, it, that it's bad, it's good to know about them. But sometimes they'll take these news reports and all of a sudden it's like, oh my gosh, the sharks are out to get us. No, they're not. <laughs> they're just really curious. And they really wanna know why we're there because we don't look like anything that they're used to seeing. What if you can't get out of the water? Well, if you can't get out of the water, then that's a different situation. Um, the best thing to do is to try to be as calm as possible. Um, the things that a shark is looking for when they eat is they're looking for something that is, we often think that they're gonna go for like the strongest, healthiest animal. They're not, they're gonna be looking for the weaker animals. They're gonna be looking for the ones that might be struggling a bit. Um, so fish and other animals that are not necessarily behaving like they would expect, they might be flailing around a bit. Those are gonna be the ones that they're gonna target. Um, so if you're really, really calm, just try to be, as normal and as subtle as possible and get to safety as quickly as possible. Um, one of the common questions I get is, should we punch the shark in the nose? Well, my response is, the nose is really, really close to the teeth, so I don't think that's the best option. But just get yourself to safety as quickly as possible. All right. We are an invasive species to sharks. You know, that's an interesting way to think about it. Yeah, I like to think of it more if we share habitat. 
we both have uses for that space. Um, we just have to think about which is important. Is it, you know, life, you know, sustaining their life or our recreation? And there are certain times of the year when we are more likely to use that water, um, but they're always using it. And so we, have, we just have to kind of think about our behaviors and which one, which one is really more important. What's the priority? All right, so we have just a few more minutes. We have to learn to live with each other and share this amazing planet. Oh, Nikki, you're brilliant. You're absolutely right. There are so many amazing animals, so many amazing species, and we all have such great importance on this planet. Um, Ms. Leslie was saying, you know, biodiversity. We all have so much to offer, but we all have to be able to contribute. That means we've got to be accepting of one another and we've got to, we've got to do our part, right? So we can't just sit back and let everybody else do it. We've got to do our part, but we have to make room to let all of the other species do what they're here to do as well. I love it. All right, I see we have more questions coming in. Oh, you guys are amazing. Can sharks kill people? You know, truth be told, absolutely, it could happen. Um, someone could sustain a, an injury that is so, um, so traumatic that it could cause death. But of the 29, that 29 bites that I mentioned before that the sand tigers have reportedly um, been involved in, there were no fatalities. So I don't, I don't like to suggest that that is the intent. Um, it really isn't. It's always a matter of curiosity. Um, and most of the time it's just, oh, I thought you were food, but nope, you're not. You're not on my menu at all. Are sharks bad luck? You know what? I would never go against what a mama says. If mom told you that they're bad luck, then, you know, trust mom. But I would say for me, I feel like sharks are not bad luck. I would say having sharks around is so important and it's actually really good and really positive for our oceans and for our ecosystems um, that as long as we have sharks, we're in pretty good standing. But when we start seeing them decline and go away, that's when the bad luck has started. That's when we, we, we need to really, really start thinking about um, what role we're playing in the big picture. Are there things that we could do better so that we don't lose our sharks? And I, I think most of the time there are. So one of those things that we mentioned before is make sure we're purchasing sustainable seafood. Um, you can even ask when you go to a seafood restaurant, hey guys, how is this seafood caught? Um, so you can use that Seafood Watch app or website to learn more about that. Um, but again, just learn more. Appreciate all these incredible animals. And guys, I am so, so grateful to be a part of this takeover today. Um, we are hoping to continue this Creature Connections every single month. So stay tuned to our uh, websites and our social media, both for the zoo and the North Carolina Aquarium at Fort Fisher. And we really hope to see you in our Creature Connections. Next month, or excuse me, is it next week? Next month? Either way, your zoo classroom's coming back. We're only taking over just today. So thank you so much for allowing us to take over. We loved your questions. They were fantastic. And we hope to see you in our next Creature Connections.